1 Corinthians chapter 3. Familiar text, but I'm going to read from the Message Bible. I've been looking at this uh, all, all week, and I just feel like it says it a little, a little uniquely. You realize, don't you, that you are the temple of God and that God himself is present in you. No one will get by with vandalizing God's temple. You can be sure of that. God's temple is sacred, and you, remember, are the temple. You realize, don't you, that you are the temple of God and that God himself, the creator of all of the universe, is present in you. Let's pray real quick. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you that the scripture says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Father, there are many in here, including me, that we need to hear your word. We need faith for the situations that we're looking at right now, for obstacles, for struggles, for difficulties, for impossible situations that we're facing, areas of doubt, areas of unbelief, areas of pain, areas of loss, areas where we're wounded. Father, we need faith, and your word promises that faith would come as we hear your word. So open our ears to hear your word. And Father, I ask that you remove me as much as possible. And Father, allow my voice to be surrendered to your voice. Let there be a voice within my voice that speaks to every heart in every situation in every life so faith can rise up and help us go out and conquer and defeat anything that's standing in front of us that would keep us back from your perfect will in Jesus' name. We all said amen, amen. Amen. I can remember in sixth grade, really all throughout elementary, at the end of every year in our school, we had a big track and field day. Anybody have that around here? I don't know what they do over in Kentucky. So some of you guys had a big track and field day. Uh, And this was a big thing for us. This was a big deal. And sixth grade year, was kind of the biggest year because this is before sixth grade was moved up into middle school, right? When it was, was the way it was supposed to be, sixth graders were like the seniors of the elementary class. Anybody remember that? And uh, so this was the year you were supposed to bring home all blue ribbons because you're the upperclassmen. And we put together a relay dream team. The fastest kids in the school were all on the same team. They didn't have a chance. We were going to kill it. And I remember the day we were so far ahead in the relay from all the other teams, we started to showboat a little bit. People started doing somersaults and running backwards and falling asleep, stopping just falling asleep and then waking up. And we were that far ahead that we were, you know, sort of mocking uh, the other teams. And so my turn in the relay came. And so I just joined in the festivity, started showboating, tried to run backwards, and I fell down and I dropped the baton and the person in the next lane kicked the baton underneath the playground fence. So I couldn't get the baton. So not only did we not get first, come on, then we could have at least, you know, if you don't get first, there's the Ricky Bobby theology, right? If you're not first, you're last. That's, 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 we didn't even get to, to claim that. We didn't get second. We didn't get third or fourth. We didn't even finish the race. We were totally disqualified because we never finished. We never finished the race. Never even finished. Caught up on being distracted with how far ahead we were, comparing ourselves to others, distracted by comparison. We never finished our race. You know, Paul said it like this in his second letter to Timothy. He said, I finished my race. I kept the faith. He goes on to say, as a result of that, I'm in heaven. When I get to heaven, that there will be a crown of righteousness for me. My reward will be there. He says, I've poured my whole life out. Everything that I had, I gave it. I poured my whole life out. And the result is, I'm at the end And I'm not going to just die and get to heaven. I have finished my race. I've kept the faith. We're all going to have that moment. 
we're all going to have that day, probably not only the most important day in your life, but probably the most important day in all of eternity is preparing for that moment when you stand before God and you will either be someone that died and never finished the race, never even finished. You were gifted, you were qualified, you were, you were given all kinds of opportunities, you, you were graced by God, but like me as a sixth grader, distracted, looking at the wrong things, comparing myself. You know, the Bible actually says this, that, that in Proverbs, that we give our years to the cruel one. That we'll look back on our life and years will have been given over to the enemy. We all can testify to years being wasted on bitterness, years given to unforgiveness, years given to addiction, just years of our life handed over, given by us to the cruel one. And if that continues, we get to the end of our life, we die and we never finished our race. We never finished it. Well, I love what Paul says here because I think he gives us a key. I think he gives us a key in how we can get to that moment and say what Paul said, I finished my race. I kept the faith. And he says it like this, that did you not know that your body is the temple of God? That God himself lives in you. We would know now that this is somewhat of an Old Testament reference. He's speaking about, in the Old Testament, there was something called the temple. And the temple was located on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. It was destroyed in 70 A.D. But this is where the temple was located. And this is the spot on the planet that God dwelled. This was the God spot. It's not that God didn't dwell other places on the planet. This was the spot that his glory was. Or where he was, the word glory means weighty. This is the spot that the presence of God was concentrated and it was weighty. And there were specific instructions that the priest was given every single day to make sure that the temple was the place that was prepared for the presence and the glory and the weighty, concentrated of presence of God could dwell. There are things every day that the priest was called to do. Now, I know that we're in the New Testament, but the Bible says in Hebrews that when God spoke of the Israelites and the Hebrews, that everything that he did in their life was laid out as a pattern for us, as an example for us on how we are to live our life today. And so we look back at these patterns, the way that the priest every single day would make sure that the temple was a place where God could dwell. I don't know about you, but I know that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I want my life to be a place that God's presence can be concentrated. I want my life to be a place that his his presence can be weighty. I want my life to be a place that the presence of God can flood my life and overflow out of my life. And if there are some things that I can do to prepare my life, to be, to prepare my days, my body, to be the temple of God and not vandalize the temple, I wanna know what those things are. Why? So I can get to the end and say, man, I finished my race. I was poured out. I kept the faith, I did it. Now I'm ready to stand before God knowing that I'm ready to receive my crown. So seven things, seven things quickly that the high priest did every single day. Before we get to those, these things happened every single morning, first thing. Every single morning, the first thing was the high priest was called to do these seven things. He wasn't to wait throughout the day. He wasn't to procrastinate to the end of the day. God said, when you wake up, this is your responsibility. These are the things I want you to do. I want you to do these things first because God's instructions are to put him first. Now we hear this all the time, but the idea of first things is that God knows we can't give him everything. So symbolically, the way we declare to God, you own everything, I am fully surrendered to you, is not by giving him everything, but is by giving him the first. God knows we have work. God knows we have to sleep. God knows we have other responsibilities. God knows we have the practical things every day in our life that we can't give him every single second of every single day. So what do we do? We come to church. You're here at church today. This is you giving the first thing. This is Sabbath. This isn't a life. 
right thing. You're coming and facing, and God, as I put you first, I give you this sliver of time. What are you doing? You're asking God to bless all the time. I can't give you everything, even though I want to, so I give you first, and in giving you first, I'm declaring that I believe that you are in control of it all. This happens when we bring our tithe, we bring the first. This happens when we wake up in the morning and we give the first part of our day, our time. That's, again, that's the first. And that's what the high priest did every single day. And the reason that you have to do this stuff first is because the devil will take advantage of your time if you don't. He'll slither in there. He'll help you procrastinate. He'll give you every excuse and every reason in the book to put God far down on the list, third, fourth, fifth, last. And so putting him first is a key to every one of these seven things. Number one, the high priest every single day would wake up and he would go out and he would open all of the gates. There was the inner court, the, the inner court gate, the outer court gate, and then there was the gate on the outside of the holy, or I'm sorry, outside the eastern gate. And so all of these different gates, the high priest would open. He would walk out there and he would make sure that he managed who came in and who left, what entered and what exited, what 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 exited. He would manage all those things by being the gatekeeper. The first thing that he would do every day is he would say, I've got to make sure I keep the gates. You are the gatekeeper of your life. No one else will manage what comes in your life and what leaves your life, what enters your life and what exits your life but you. God's not going to be the gatekeeper of your life. You are the gatekeeper of your life. The Bible says you guard your own heart for out of your heart flow the issues of life. If you have a lot of issues in your life, many times it's because you didn't guard your heart. You are the gatekeeper. Your gate is your eye gate, your ear gate, and your mouth gate. You are responsible to make sure you're cautious with what you let come in those gates. If you just wake up and you do nothing but let trash come in your eye gate, trash come in your ear gate, then guess what's going to come out of your mouth gate? Guess what's going to come out of your Facebook post? Guess what's going to come out on Instagram? It's going to be trash. Guess what's going to come out at work? Guess what's going to come out in the people you text? It's going to be trash. But if you will wake up and you will behold God's word, if you'll woke, wake up and allow your eye gate to feed and to allow his word to enter you, if you'll allow your ear to be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit, turn on some worship music, allow your eye gate and your ear gate to be filled with those things, you know what you're going to find is the mouth gate is going to begin to speak things differently. You'll have the edge in life, you'll have the advantage in life because you're hearing what other people don't hear. You're seeing what other people won't see. So you're able to speak things that other people cannot speak. You'll be able to speak life where other people see nothing but discouragement and death and failure and negativity. You'll be able to speak hope and joy and strength and grace and love. Why? Because you saw all of that. Now you can speak those things. The, the Bible says in Amos chapter three that that God, when he reveals something, he reveals it first to his prophets. That sounds really spiritual, but prophecy just means speaking the word of God over situations. Whatever situation exists in your life, you can either speak to it based on facts, you can speak to it based on what you see, based on what the culture said, says, based on what the world is saying, whatever they're outraged about, you get outraged about, whatever they're upset about, you get upset about, and you speak emotionally, you speak based on feeling, and that's how you can speak to it, or you can put the right thing in the right gates, and before you know know it, you can speak the word of God over situations. You can speak what he says over situations. And when you do that, it lays the foundation for the rest of the day. So number one, you are the gatekeeper. Number two, the high priest would not only keep the gate, but he would clean ashes out of the brazen altar. Every single day, there was a fire on the altar that would never stop burning. And so as a result, the ashes would begin to build up and they would have to take those ashes and sweep them in a box. And God gave specific instructions to take those ashes through the Kidron Valley down to the Kidron River. The Kidron River began 
in Jerusalem, or it, there was, it flowed through Jerusalem, which is about 2,500 uh, feet above sea level. And that Kidron River would flow all the way down to the Dead Sea, about 1,300 feet below sea, sea level. So you have to get the image every single day. The high priest would go and sweep the ashes from the sacrifices that were given for people's sin. He would sweep those things up and he would carry the sin, the sacrifice, those ashes down to the Kidron River and it would flow all the way down and empty out in the Dead Sea. You know, the Bible actually says that God will take your sin and throw it in the sea of forgetfulness no more. And yes, you and I, yes, you and I pray for forgiveness. We receive Christ. We receive that one time moment where we say, God, I give you my life. I surrender to you. I repent of my sin. I turn completely to you and we receive Christ. That is a one time moment of forgiveness. But you cannot neglect the need for ongoing times with God where you sweep the ashes out, where you just simply admit and acknowledge, man, Things have a way of attaching themselves to us. We get all ashy, if you know what I'm talking about. Just, you just get all oh, just stuff attached to you. You get mistakes and failures and sin and compromise and things people do to you and say to you, things that they shouldn't have said, that they say, and all that stuff attaches itself to you. And so every single day to wake up and do a mind sweep just to allow that stuff to be swept out of your life, cleaned out of your life. You give it back to God. You, you, you take the, 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 the sacrifices and the ashes and the past things that you've done, even successes that you've, you've accomplished, and you bring all of that and you sweep everything clean. And I love this part. They take it down to the river. I love the idea that God said, when you and I pray, out of our belly will flow rivers of living water. So this is a reference to every day you don't just keep the gates, but every single day you make sure you clean the ashes out. And one of the greatest ways to do that is by praying in the Holy Spirit. If God's given you your prayer language, you use that prayer language. If you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, don't just leave that. you got to continue to pray and continue to build your holy faith by praying praying in the spirit. If you haven't been given that, then you just begin to say, God, inspire my prayer. Let, let the Holy Spirit make intercession through me and just pray and ask God and bless him. And as you do that, you're allowing those rivers of living water to flow through your life and flow through you so you can sweep clean anything that's tried to attach itself to you throughout the days of your life. I love the third thing that it says that the high priest did. It said that he would take incense and fistfuls of incense and he would pour it on the altar. The idea was the sacrifices would produce a smell of death and the incense had special spices in it to cover up that smell and to keep flies away. And so the high priest would take handfuls of incense. That incense would create an aroma that would go up and that God would breathe in and he would be pleased with the sacrifices because it wasn't just the sacrifice alone, but it was also the, the, the incense or what represented the worship of the people that would go up to God, which means you and I, not only should we pray and ask God for things, we should also finish up what we ask God for by worshiping. And worship is just acknowledging to God whether you play a song or it's a personal time of worship. It's just a time where you say, okay, God, I've given this stuff to you. I've talked to you about it. I don't understand this thing and I, I'm frustrated with this over here and I don't, I don't get why this is happening and I'm struggling in this area of my life and I'm disappointed with this thing. But God, I've given it to you. I've prayed it's in your hands and worship is you're just fully giving it over to him. I, I cast my cares on you because you care for me. And how do you do that? You do that in worship. Worship gives your prayer wings. You just begin to say, okay, God, I've prayed about it. I've prayed for my babies. I've prayed for this area of my life that I'm in a trial. I give it to you and I thank you that you are more able than I am. You are more capable than I am. And I acknowledge that in worship and I fully trust that you are able to do what I cannot do. And as the high priest would take that incense and he would put it on the altar, he had little bells on his pinky. And so those bells would ring. 
And the reason for this is it acted like a doorbell. Worship is like a doorbell. When you go to someone's house, you don't just walk in their front door. You ring the doorbell. And the doorbell is what signals the people on the inside. Someone is here and they want to come in. When you and I worship, it acts like a doorbell to God. It just lets him know we're here. We're in your house. We're, we're desiring to come into your presence. We're desiring to come in. When you come to church on the weekend, we don't just sing songs up front because we want your feet to hurt. We don't just sing songs up front because we want to waste time and we don't have anything better to do. No, we're coming as his people and we're ringing the doorbell of worship and we're saying, God, we want to enter into your presence. We want to be with you. And we do that through worship. The fourth thing that the high priest would do is he would put oil, fresh oil, in the menorah every day. Oil that came from freshly pressed olives, he would place it there in the lampstand. I believe that every single person needs to understand that there is moments where you have to say, God, I need a fresh anointing for what you have for me in this new season. When David went to Samuel, or Samuel came to David as a young shepherd boy, he was anointed to be the future king. But he still had to be anointed when he faced Goliath a second time. And he had to be anointed again when he took leadership over Judah, and anointed again when he became king over Israel. An anointing isn't a one-time thing. In Psalms 92 and verse 10, David said, I will be anointed with fresh oil. He knew that he would need to be anointed with fresh oil depending on what he was facing. If he was facing a giant, facing an obstacle, facing impossible odds, facing things that were bigger than him, greater than him, things he saw no natural way that he could overcome, he would need a fresh anointing for that battle and for that giant. If it was an area of leadership, he knew that he needed to be anointed to lead God's people. He knew he needed to be anointed to do what God was calling him to do. And every person in this room needs to be anointed for whatever battle and giant you're facing. And you need to be anointed to lead. Dad, you're a leader. Mom, you're a leader. Believer, whether you're a manager at work or not, you're there leading. You're being an example. You're setting the tone. You're modeling the way in church. Guess what? You are here and someone is watching you. You are leading everyone around you and you don't just lead like it's not a big deal you lead by saying God I need a fresh anointing for this new season as a pastor you don't care if I was anointed last year for that season you want to know if I have sought God and and done my job to get before God and receive a fresh anointing for today. You care about has he put the work in to receive a fresh anointing for today. That's what you care about. That's what you want. And it works the same way with you. You got to say, okay, it was one thing in my 20s. I faced certain battles. I had certain opportunities and I needed one anointing. And you get into your 30s, you need a new anointing. You get into the different seasons of your life, you need a fresh anointing from God. And every day the high priest would show up and he would get a new anointing for a new day. I'm gonna go fast here. Number five, he would sacrifice the lamb and apply the blood. You know, a lot of times people hear things like the blood of Jesus in church and, and there's even been controversy around that this is something that's grotesque and we gotta be cautious of. But it's just because people don't understand how beautiful the, the, the idea of, of Jesus and his blood really is. I mean, this is a beautiful, wonderful thing. And, and the, the Bible says we overcome, not just by the word of our testimony, but we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And the blood of Jesus, we know, was sinless and was perfect and was precious, but it was shed. And the reason that it was shed was to provide an atonement for you and I. Atonement just means it covers us. Now, many people think this is just a spiritual thing. That you, you, Jesus paid a price spiritually for you, and he shed his blood just for your spiritual life, your, to cover your sin, but this is not true. Jesus not only shed his blood in a spiritual way, he also, guess what, physically shed his blood. So the atonement of God 
is threefold, body, soul, and spirit. He didn't just suffer physically, he suffered mentally, he suffered emotionally, he suffered relationally as his mom was mourning at the cross. He suffered in all of these ways. And so when you apply the blood of Jesus to your life, you are not just applying it to a spiritual area of your life, Over here, you apply it to every single area of your life. Your relationship, your marriage, you apply it to your friendships. Even when you drive by the church, you should be saying, Father, I thank you that the blood of Jesus is there because the way they overcome is not just by what they say, but it's by your precious blood being on all that they do, covering what they do, you being on everything that they touch, everything that happens, you need to be on it. Your life needs the blood of Jesus on it. Mentally, the enemy will attack you. Emotionally, the enemy will attack you. Discouragement, depression, all of those things will get a hold of you. What do you need? You need to say, Father, I thank you that Jesus not only died for me to get to heaven, but he died for me to be whole, body, soul, and spirit. That means you can heal my mind, heal my emotions, heal my relationship. There is nothing outside of the price that he paid. Number six, you take the show bread and they would put it out every single day. This is fresh bread every day. When the children of Israel went through the wilderness, we know that every day God gave them manna and that manna was designed to not be kept or stored, that they had to have faith that God would provide daily. And so the high priest carried this image over into every day, bringing fresh bread out. Every single day in the temple, it was fresh bread. Now, what makes bread good? What makes bread great? It's not new ingredients. It's not some like technological advancement in how to bake bread. What makes bread great is that it's fresh. What makes bread nasty is that it's old and stale. So you and I need fresh bread. Every single day when we wake up, we need to get in the word of God and it's the same ingredients. It's not new ingredients. Over time, it's going to be the same old stuff. It's the same old Proverbs. It's the same old Psalms. It's the same old Pauline epistles. It's the same old Gospels. It's the same old prophets. But God can make it fresh to you. You don't have to spend hours to get something fresh. Just wake up and just read a proverb. Take you one, two, three, four, five minutes. Just read just, just as much time as you can get it. But what you're beginning to do is say every day, I'm the priest of this temple. God himself lives on the inside of me and I'm trying to create a place where the presence of God can be weighty in my everyday life. And so getting your life in his word is a key, having that fresh bread every day. And then finally, number seven, the high priest had to keep the fire burning. The way that he did this because the various elements would try to put the fire out, they had three different fires So there was always a backup fire. One fire was fueled by the wood from a fig tree. Another was fueled by the wood from an olive tree. And then the third fire was fueled by the wood from a nut tree. Notice all trees that fueled fires in the temple were fruitful trees. So you can't separate fruit from fire. They're connected. People say all the time, I, I need to get on fire for God. Or, or, you know, the Bible even talks about being baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire. But don't mistake fire as all you need. If you don't have fruit, then the fire isn't going to last. And you know how God gives you fruit? Fruits of the Spirit, think about it. Gentleness, meekness, kindness, long-suffering, peace. You know how you get all those things? By dealing with difficult people, complicated situations, struggles, trials. That's how you get the fruit in your life. So all of that stuff that's going on in your life that you think is negative and bad. No, all that stuff's where God produces the fruit. And that fruit fuels the fire in your life. So do not disconnect the fruit from the fire. The fruit actually fuels the fire in your life and in your heart. Every day, the high priest would wake up. And he would do these things to make sure that God's presence could be weighty. Every single day, every single day, every single day. Most of these things can be done in a brief amount of time. And Paul said to the church of Corinth, do you not understand? Do you not get that your body's the temple? Do you not understand that God himself dwells in you? 
And, and do you not understand that if you vandalize it, you're not going to get to the end and have a testimony, I finished my race? You're not gonna have the testimony, God, I finished the course. You can have the testimony, I was given opportunity, I was given talent, I was given gifting, I was given all this, but for some reason or another, because I didn't keep, I wasn't the priest of the temple, because I didn't keep it, I get to the very end, and guess what? I died, but I didn't finish. I'm sixth grade Marcus, thinking about all kinds of other things, distracted by all kinds of other things, and I never even finish what I set out to do. So this is going to be, we're finishing the fast. We've got a few days left, a week left. And 6 a.m. prayer, Monday through Friday. Tuesday night, we're going to be here praying. And maybe you've been out of the fast because of the snow and you just kind of lost it. Listen, let's finish strong. Let's not pull back at the end. Let's, let's, let's push in these last few days more than we have the entire, and you say, well, what's the point? I missed the whole first part. We've been fasting for you. We've been praying with you. Let's take this next few days and say, God, we need a fresh anointing for a new year. We need fresh oil on 2019. Come on. Anybody here that says, man, I, I, I don't know what God has for me in 2019, but I know that I need just a fresh anointing on my life for this new year.